The Chronicles of Prydain by Lloyd Alexander. Book Three The Castle of Lear. Chapter One Prince Rune. Ilanwe of the Red Gold Hair, the Princess Ilanwe, daughter of Angra, daughter of Rigat, of the Royal House of Lear, was leaving Caer Dalbin. Dalbin himself had so ordered it, and though Tarrant's heart was suddenly and strangely heavy, he knew there was no gainsaying the old enchanter's words. On the spring morning set for Ilanwe's departure, Tarrant saddled the horses and led them from the stable. The princess, looking desperately cheerful, had wrapped her few belongings in a small bundle slung from her shoulder. At her neck hung a fine chain and crescent moon of silver. On her finger she wore a ring of ancient craftsmanship, and in the fold of her cloak she carried another of her most prized possessions, the golden sphere that shone at her command with a light brighter than a flaming torch. Dalbin, whose face was more careworn than usual and whose back was bowed as though under a heavy burden, embraced the girl at the cottage door. <laughs> you shall always have a place in care, Dalbin, he said, <laughs> and a larger one in my heart. <sighs> but alas, raising a young lady is a mystery beyond even an enchanter's skill. <laughs> I have had he added with a quick smile. Mm, difficulties enough raising an assistant pig keeper. <laughs> I wish you a fair voyage to the Isle of Mona, Dalbin went on. King Rune and Queen Teleria are kindly. King Rudalum and Queen Teleria are kindly and gracious. They are eager to stand in your family's stead and serve as your protectors. And from Queen Teleria, you shall learn how a princess should behave. What? cried Ilanwe. I don't care about being a princess. And since I'm already a young lady, how else could I behave? That's like asking a fish to learn how to swim. Yeah. Dalbin said wryly. I have never seen a fish with skinned knees, torn robe, and unshod feet. <laughs> They would ill become him as they ill become you. He set a gnarled hand gently on Ilanwe's shoulder. Child, child, do you not see? For each of us comes a time when we must be more than what we are. He turned now to Taran. Watch over her carefully, he said. I have certain misgivings about letting you and Gurgi go with her. But if it will ease your parting, so be it. The Princess Ilanwe shall go safely to Mona, Taran answered. And you, said Talbin, return safely. My heart will not be at ease until you do. He embraced the girl again and went quickly into the cottage. It had been decided that Call would accompany them to Great Auburn Harbor and lead back the horses. The stout old warrior, already mounted, waited patiently. Shaggy-haired Gurgi, astride his pony, looked as mournful as an owl with a stomach ache. Ka, the tame crow, perched in unwanted silence on Taran's saddle. Taran helped Ilanwe mount Leluger, her favorite steed, then swung to the back of Malinless, his silver mane stallion. Leaving Caer Dalbin behind, the little band set out across the soft hills toward Arvin. Side by side, Taran and Call rode ahead of the others to lead the way. Ka, meanwhile, having made himself comfortable on Taran's shoulder. She never stopped talking for a moment, Taran said gloomily. Now at least it will be quieter in Cairdalban. Yeah, that it will, said Call. And less to worry about. She was always getting into one scrape or another. Mm, that too, said Call. It's for the best, Taran said. I long way is, after all, a princess of Lear. It's not as if she were only an assistant pig keeper. Yeah, very true, said Call, looking off toward the pale hills. They jogged along silently for a while. I shall miss her, Taran burst out at last, half angrily. The old warrior grinned and rubbed his shining bald head. Did you tell her that? Not, not exactly, faltered Taran. I suppose I should have. But every time I began talking about it, I, I felt very odd. Besides, you never know what silly remarks you'll come out with when you're trying to be serious. It may be, replied Call, smiling. We know least what we treasure most. 
but we will have more than enough to keep us busy when you come back. And you will learn, my boy, there is nothing like work to put the heart at rest. Tall nodded. Tarin nodded sadly. I suppose so, he said. Past midday, they turned their horses to the west, where the hills began a long slope downward into the Arvin Valley. At the last ridge, Ka hopped from Tarn's shoulder and flapped aloft, croaking with excitement. Tarn urged Malinless over the rise. Below, the great river swung into view, wider here than he had ever seen it. Sunlight flecked the water in the sheltered curve of the harbor. A long, slender craft bobbed at the shore. Tarn could make out figures aboard, hauling on ropes to raise a square, white sail. Ilanwe and Gurgi had also ridden forward. Tarn's heart leaped. And to all the companions, the sight of the harbor and the waiting vessel was like a sea wind driving sorrow before it. Ilanwe began chattering gaily, and Gurgi waved his arm so wildly he nearly tumbled from the saddle. Yes, oh yes, he cried. Bold, valiant Gurgi is glad to follow kindly master and noble princess with boatings and floatings. <laughs> they cantered down the slope and dismounted at the water's edge. Seeing them, the sailors ran a plank out from the vessel to the shore. No sooner had they done so than a young man clambered onto the plank and hastened with eager strides toward the companions. But he had hardly taken only a few paces along the swaying board when he lost his footing, stumbled, and with a loud splash pitched headlong into the shallows. Tarn and Call ran to help him, but the young man had already picked himself up and was awkwardly sloshing his way ashore. He was of Tarin's age, with a moon-round face, pale blue eyes, and straw-colored hair. He wore a sword and a small, richly ornamented dagger in a belt of silver links. His cloak and jacket, worked with threads of gold and silver, were now sopping wet. The stranger, however, appeared not the least dismayed, either by his ducking or the sodden state of his garments. Instead, he grinned as cheerfully as if nothing whatever had befallen him. Hello, hello! he called, waving a dripping hand. Is that the princess I long way I see? Of course, it must be. Without further ado, and without stopping even to wring out his cloak, he bowed so low that Tarn feared the young man would lose his balance. Then he straightened up and in a solemn voice declared, On behalf of Rudlum, son of Rude and Teleria, daughter of Tenwin, king and queen of the island of Mona, greetings to the princess I long way of the royal house of Lear and to, uh, well, uh, to all the rest of you, he added, blinking rapidly as a thought suddenly occurred to him. I should have asked your names before I started. Tarin, taken aback and not a little vexed by this scatterbrained behavior, stepped forward and presented the companions. Before he could ask the stranger's name, the young man interrupted. Splendid! You must all introduce yourselves again later, one at a time. Otherwise, I might forget. Though I see the shipmasters waving at us. Something to do with tides, no doubt. He's always very concerned with them. This is the first time I've commanded a voyage, he went on proudly. Amazing how easy it is. All you need to do is tell the sailors. But who are you? Taran asked, puzzled. The young man blinked at him. Did I forget to mention that? I'm Prince Rune. Prince Rune, Taran repeated in a tone of disbelief. Quite so, answered Rune, smiling pleasantly. King Rudlum's my father, and of course, Queen Teleria's my mother. Shall we get aboard? I shall hate to upset the shipmaster. He does worry about those tides. Call embraced Ilanwe. When we see you again, he told her, I doubt we shall recognize you. You shall be a fine princess. I want to be recognized, Ilanwe cried. I want to be me. Never fear, said Call, winking. He turned to Taran. And you, my boy. When you return, send Ka ahead to tell me, and I shall meet you at Arvard Harbor. Prince Rune, offering his arm to Ilanwe, led her across the plank. Gurgi and Tarn followed them. Having formed his own opinion of Rune's agility, Tarn kept a wary eye on the prince until Ilanwe was safe aboard. The ship was surprisingly roomy and well-fitted. The deck was low, with benches for oarsmen on either side. At the stern post was a high, square shed topped by a platform. The sailors dipped their oars and worked the vessel to the middle of the river. Call trotted along the bank and waved with all his might. The old warrior dropped from sight as the ship swung around a bend in the ever-widening river. 
caw had flapped to the masthead, and as the breeze whistled through his feathers, he beat his wings so pridefully that he looked more like a black rooster than a crow. The shore turned gray in the distance, and the craft sped seaward. If Rune had perplexed and vaguely irritated him on their first meeting, Tarn now began to wish he had never laid eyes on the prince. Tarn had meant to speak with Ilanwe apart, for there was much in his heart he longed to tell her. Yet each time he ventured to do so, Prince Rudlum would pop up as if from nowhere, his round face beaming happily, calling up, Hello, hello! A greeting Tarn found more infuriating each time he heard it. Once, the Prince of Mona eagerly dashed up to show the companions a large fish he had caught, to the delight of Ilanwe and Gurgi, but not Tarn. For a moment later, Rune's attention turned elsewhere and he hurried off, leaving Tarn holding the wet, slippery fish in his arms. Another time, while leaning over the side to point out a school of dolphins, the prince nearly dropped his sword into the sea. Luckily, Tarin caught it before the blade was lost forever. After the ship reached open water, Prince Rudlum decided to take a hand at steering, but he no sooner grasped the tiller than it flew out of his fingers. While Rune clutched at the wooden handle, the vessel lurched and slewed about so violently that Tarin was flung against the bulwark. A water cask broke loose and went rolling down the deck. The sail flapped madly at the sudden change of course, and one bank of oars nearly snapped before the steersman regained the tiller from the undismayed prince. The painful bump on Tarin's head did nothing to raise his esteem of Prince Rune's seamanship. Although the prince made no further attempt to steer the vessel, he climbed atop the platform where he called out orders to the crew. Lash up the sail! Rune shouted happily. Steady the helm! No seaman himself, Tarn nevertheless realized the sail was already tightly lashed and the craft was moving unwaveringly through the water, and he very shortly became aware that the sailors were quietly going about their task of keeping the ship on course without paying any heed whatever to the prince. Tarn's head ached from the bump, his jacket was still unpleasantly damp and fishy, and when at last his chance came to speak with Ilanwe, he was altogether out of sorts. Prince of Mona indeed, he muttered. He's no more than a, a princeling, a clumsy, muddle-headed baby. Commanding the voyage? If the sailors listened to him, we'd be aground in no time. I've never sailed a ship, but I've no doubt I could do it better than he. I've never seen anyone so feckless. Feckless? answered Ilanwe. He does often seem a little dense, but I'm sure he means well, and I have a feeling he has a good heart. In fact, I think he's rather nice. I suppose you do, Tarn replied, all the more nettled by Ilanwe's words because he gave you his arm to lean on? A gallant princely gesture. Lucky he didn't pitch you over the side. It was polite, at least, Ilanwe remarked, which is something assistant pig keepers sometimes aren't. An assistant pig keeper, Tarn snapped. Yes, that's to be my lot in life. I was born to be one, just as the princeling of Mona was born to his rank. He's a king's son, and I... And I don't even know the names of my parents. Well said Ilanwe. You can't blame room for being born. I mean, you could, but it wouldn't help matters. It's like kicking a rock with your bare foot. Tarn snorted. I dare say that's his father's sword he's got on, and I dare say he's never drawn it except to frighten a rabbit. At least I've earned the right to wear mine. Yet he still calls himself a prince. Does his birth make him worthy of his rank? As worthy as Gwydion, son of Dawn? Prince Gwydion's the greatest warrior in Prydain. Ilanwe replied. You can't expect everyone to be like him. And it seems to me that if an assistant pig keeper does the best he can and a prince does the best he can, there's no difference between them. No difference, Tarn cried angrily. You spoke well enough of Rune. Tarn of Caradalbin, Ilanwe declared. I really believe you're jealous and sorry for yourself. And that's as ridiculous as, as, as painting your nose green. Tarn said no more, but turned away and stared glumly at the water. To make matters worse, the wind freshened, the sea heaved about the sides of the ship, and Tarn could barely keep his footing. His head spun, and he feared the vessel would capsize. Ilanwe, deathly pale, clung to the bulwark. Gurgi wailed and howled pitifully. Mm, poor tender head is full of whirlings and twirlings. Gurgi does not like this ship anymore. He wants to be home. <laughs> Prince Rune appeared not the least distressed. He ate heartily and was in the best of spirits while Tarn huddled wretchedly in his cloak. The sea did not calm until dusk, and at nightfall Tarn was grateful the vessel anchored in a calm cove. Ilanwe took out the golden sphere. 
In her hands, it began to glow, and in its rays shimmered over the black water. I see. What's that? cried Prince Rune, who had clambered down from his platform. It's my bauble, said Ilanwe. I always carry it with me. You never can tell when it will come in handy. Amazing, exclaimed the prince. I've never seen anything like it in my life. He examined the golden ball carefully, but as he held it in his hand, the light winked out. Rune looked up in dismay. I'm afraid I've broken it. No, Ilanwe assured him. It's just that it doesn't work for everyone. Then believable, said Rune. You must show it to my parents. They wish we had a few of those trinkets around the castle. After a last curious glance at the bauble, Rune returned it to Ilanwe. Insisting that the princess sleep in the comfort of the shed, Rune bedded himself down amid a pile of netting. Gurgi curled up nearby, while Ka, heedless of Tarn's entreaties to leave his high perch, roosted on the mast. Rune, falling asleep instantly, snored so piercingly that Taran, already vexed beyond endurance, stretched out on the deck as far as possible from the slumbering prince. When Taran slept at last, he dreamed the companions had never left Caer Dalbin. <laughs>